So the, this slideshow is a set of uh, slides uh, with common problems or issues or ideas that you uh, give you give you ideas of uh, how to deal with them. For example, um, radish is a very easy crop to grow. You can harvest within 30 days. Uh, if you like them not to be pungent, uh, grow them in cool weather. So maybe now is the last time you can start growing them before they get too spicy at harvest. Uh, but uh, most people don't know the spacing and they uh, crowd them and uh, they don't enlarge. And the problem uh, is, uh, the solution is if you want them to enlarge, if you see like this, uh, uh, this uh, picture, you can remove maybe every other one uh, and then the rest uh, will get a lot bigger. Uh, so maybe um, uh, half inch to an inch at the most between seeds and then thin them to one inch when they get bigger, you have two harvests. One that is small, the radishes, and the leaves are very tender and they're very tasty, and the bigger one uh, for later harvest. Uh, when they're crowded, they compete with each other. Okay, what do you think this is? What kind of nutrient deficiency? Uh, people think it's uh, the most common reaction. They think it's I, uh, ri uh, sorry, nitrogen deficiency. Uh, but it's uh, really uh, iron. Uh, uh, for me, uh, it's not nitrogen because the good leaves are very dark green. Uh, when you have a nitrogen deficiency, the whole plant is uh, pale green, and with severe nitrogen, then you may get uh, this yellowing and the veins stay green. But this is typical of uh, iron deficiency, and uh, uh, especially on the uh, on the older leaves. Okay. Okay. Um, squash is very popular in Texas, and sometimes you see the plant uh, nice and plump in the morning, and then you go at noon or in the afternoon, it's wilted. You go next day, and the same thing happens. It's uh, fine and during the day, and uh, in the early in the morning, and then in the afternoon, it's wilted again. Well, that pest is your vine borer. Uh, the damage is already done. Um, there's lots of ways you can fix it. Um, you know, uh, the, for a homeowner, the easiest way is to scout uh, your the bottom side of the leaves, uh, look up what the vine border eggs look like, and you when the minute you see uh, the first flower on the young plant, start looking on the bottom side of the leaf, and you see the cluster of brown eggs, you crush them, and you're done. You don't have it. Once that worm uh, uh, enters the stem, there's very few things a homeowner can spray uh, to to deal with that. So, of course, bacterial wilt is an, possibly another problem. Uh, uh, and what happens is the roots uh, rot and the, uh, the stem on the inside rots. And uh, the bacterial wilt is something that you uh, control by controlling the insects. Uh, cucumber beetle is the vector, is the one that when it's chewing on the uh, squash leaves, uh, it infects it with the bacterial wilt. So insect control early in the season uh, is a very good idea to avoid later diseases, uh, diseases later in the season. Okay, um, if you have um, okra uh, and you see a few that are starting to be um, uh, a few, not you won't see it on every single one, um, bent or crooked. Uh, more than likely, it's uh, insect sting, and I'll explain to you what I mean by that. Uh, if an insect stings it on this side here, on the inside of the curve, this little tissue here is dead and it's not growing well, uh, whereas on the other side, it's still expanding and growing well. So it basically pushes the uh, pushes the fruit towards that uh, curve where this thing happened. So one clue is look on the inside of the curve, like at this point I'm showing here, uh, and uh, you may see a black, uh, a yellow spot. You may see a, a spot of dead tissue. Uh, and again, a reminder that uh, insect control uh, early in the season will will help uh, fix a lot of problems. Okay, um, cucumber, 
Uh, same thing. Uh, this is what we, we what we call gourd like. You see the big one here on the left where it's curved, but the end is really swollen up, kind of like a squash or zucchini. And the problem here is again uh, could be insect pollination on the inside of the curve. So you look here. Uh, oops, you look here on the inside of the curve. You see if there's any dead tissue from an insect sting. Um, and uh, if not, I would say there's no uh, hope for this cucumber to get better. So cut it open and look at the seeds inside. Uh, if you don't see uh, big uh, developing seeds, then uh, you know that you had poor pollination. The weather was cold, um, uh, the bees were not flying. And so uh, if you open it, you may see big seeds here on this end, and you may see no seeds here or very tiny seeds on this end. And that's your clue that you had uh, poor pollination. Nothing you can do. If you're a big grower or you have a big garden, then maybe you get a beehive or incur plant wildflowers to encourage bees to come to your garden. Uh, if it's an uh, insect sting, there is something you can do, like I told you, uh, uh, early season insect control is always uh, a um, uh, definitely a requirement. This is what we call buckeye rot um, of tomatoes. Uh, here in this picture you see two infections right next to each other. Um, uh, otherwise, sometimes you see only one and it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger and the tissue below so uh, in the, the tissue inside the tomato gets softer and uh, tastes terrible. Um, how to avoid it? It's very easy. It's very easy disease to control uh, to to manage uh, culturally. Just uh, put mulch. What's happening is the uh, rain or water. You're splashing water. The soil splashes or the water splashes from the soil to the bottom leaves or on the bottom fruits and infect the fruit. So if you put mulch and uh, as a barrier to separate your soil from your plant, yeah, very easy disease to control. And again, very easy according to me. You ask the specialist to tell you differently. But uh, just cultural practice, um, good way to control this uh, issue. Okay, um, many homeowners um, worry about uh, watering, so they go overboard and they water their transplants every day. And if you do that and you start seeing some uh, green moss growing on your uh, top of your uh, flat or uh, some of the seedlings wilting and dying, well, because you overwatered. And this disease is uh, this is called damping of disease. Uh, it's a soil-borne pathogen uh, that kills it. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, this disease is, uh, effective, uh, is more serious on younger plants. As the plant gets older and older, it becomes more um, uh, tolerant and more resistant to the disease. So do not overwater. Um, you know, uh, I, I cannot tell you once a day or twice a day, watering is something that you have to see and decide, do I need to do it? Uh, but, if you, but if the potting mix is black, uh, more than likely it has enough moisture. Uh, if it's brown and a solid block separated from the edges, then it's bone dry. So you, you want somewhere in between. Generally, once a day, early in the season, uh, this time of year is more than enough. All right. Do you need to plant the potato seed pieces with the eyes facing up? That's a common question. Uh, hey, do I need to plant it up? No. Commercial growers, they just uh, uh, take a hole and throw it in there. So you don't have to baby it and make it face up because no matter how it's facing in the soil, it will adjust and follow in its own nature and, and uh, grow, uh, grow uh, up. Okay, so no need to worry about that. Uh, uh, preferably, uh, if you're a gar new gardener, uh, get small pieces of potatoes so you don't have to worry about cutting them to smaller size. This way you can plant the whole thing. Uh, 
So anything like a uh, uh, two ounce piece, small pieces of potatoes, those, those are best. The bigger ones, of course, you can cut them as long as each one has a germinating eye uh, in it and uh, you'll be fine. Uh, a lot of us grow um, uh, beans, uh, you know, um, especially during the summer. It's a great crop. Uh, I encourage you all to grow beans. It's a nitrogen fixing plant. Um, if you, uh, the plant residue, when you harvest it, put it in a compost pile and chop it, uh, incorporate it in your soil. You put back a lot of the nitrogen that they fixed on their own from the air. It's a great overall uh, plant uh, in the rotation. Um, a common fungal disease on green beans is rust, and this is uh, advanced symptoms of that. Uh, if you, uh, with this or with any disease, when you reach, uh, in my opinion, when you reach the stage, uh, you have missed the boat by at least a month. Uh, in my opinion, uh, fungicide uh, or disease, uh, pesticides. Uh, they are more are protectants instead of, uh, instead of uh, uh, kill the disease and fix the problem. So you spray to protect the tissue, the foliage, the fruit from becoming infected. There are some products that have uh, kickback action, means they, they can kill the disease uh, uh, one, two, or three days of activity, but it doesn't uh, cure it, doesn't kill the disease completely. So. Uh, spray on a regular uh, schedule, I, and again, differs for different locations, humidity, uh, temperature varies. Uh, but, you know, let's say 10 to 14 days schedule, you spray, you protect the new foliage from becoming infected, and you'll be fine. Organic pesticides, regular pesticides um, uh, can do the work. Okay. Uh, Peas uh, this time of year uh, in the fall are a great crop. Uh, we love snow peas, uh, um, and of course, some, sometimes you don't have the peas filling up and producing pods. Well, um, like I said, uh, with the beans, uh, beans and peas are all, both are nitrogen fixing uh, plants. Uh, you add too much nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, you are encouraging a lot of uh, foliar uh, growth and development instead of fruit development. So if you have a six foot tall uh, pea and not a single flower on it, then uh, ask yourself uh, how much uh, chicken litter or animal manure or fertilizer uh, did I add? Uh, and next year, maybe put a third or, or none uh, if, uh, if, if needed. Any questions on how much you need to add or how much you added and if you have that problem, you have my email, send me an email and I'll be happy to, uh, to uh, address that, uh, your fertilization specifically. Okay, so remember NPK, the way I think about them is N for leaves, P is for roots, and K is for fruits. So if you're growing a leafy crop, like lettuce, like a Swiss chard, like mustard greens, you want to make sure they have enough nitrogen. If you're growing root crop or early in the developing of plants, of any plant, when you are encouraging a lot of root to grow, you want to, make, you want to put a lot of phosphorus uh, uh, in the fertilizer. Uh, but when uh, uh, fruit starts to, or if, you, if you're growing a root crop, uh, sorry, a fruit crop, or the tomato starts to f f set fruit, that's when you want to um, uh, uh, reduce the nitrogen, add more potassium. So remember, NPK is uh, leaves, roots, fruits. Okay, does uh, cauliflower do better in the spring or in the fall? I get that question all the time. In the fall, if uh, you are willing to accept a smaller head uh, size at harvest, you can plant it in the spring. Um, it will be a smaller plant, smaller head size, um, because when it warms up uh, here in Texas, it will warm up real fast, real quick, uh, and um, it may even go to bulb directly. But in the fall, uh, plant it early, so it has plenty of time. 
uh, and uh, and another point here I want to show you see the center leaves have been cut to show you the fruit uh, usually those are bundled up together and use a clothes pin to uh, to cover that um, uh, to, to cover that developing head uh, if you really like it to be super white uh, uh, because it can be very sensitive to sunburn uh, cover it with a, bring all those center leaves uh, tie them with a rubber band or a clothespin uh, and keep that center head from seeing the sun okay next slide <clears throat> which three vegetables should always be transplanted in the home garden uh, specifically in Texas well in, uh, in any other uh, when I was in Kentucky, we we did the same thing. Um, all right. Well, uh, this slide shows you one of those three: uh, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant. Why? This little seedling of tomato that's about four inches tall is at least four weeks old. And remember, we have very short to growing season for tomatoes. By July, July first, mid July. The temperature is, and humidity are so high, they stop the full flowers abort. So you want to get all your harvest as fast as possible. So by transplanting instead of seeding pepper, tomatoes, and eggplant, you gain a four or six weeks, um, six weeks uh, time, uh, you know, in the field. Okay. Lettuce, uh, you can seed if you know what you're doing. Um, of course, you seed too early in the summer or too early in the fall. I mean, uh, the soil temperature may be too hot and they won't germinate. Uh, so uh, if, uh, if you can transplant, uh, grow it yourself and transplant it, at least you guarantee that they just germinated, survived, they were not dug up by birds and even, et cetera. Okay, somebody has the video on, they can turn it off, be nice. What causes these trails and leaves? This is a, uh, a mature, from the look of it, a mature tomato plant. I can see they reach towards the top of the bamboo stakes, the trellising system uh, they have. And uh, well, this is a, a leaf miner. It's an insect that, uh, uh, burrows itself inside, eats, eats the uh, tissue or, or between the two layers, the upper and lower layer of the leaves, and then hatches and lays eggs, another one. Uh, so like I said, this looks like it's very late in the season. Uh, there's really nothing you can uh, spray once they are inside the leaves. Towards the end of the season, is it worth spraying something? Uh, and uh, no. Uh, if this was early in the season and you have two or three lines, uh, minor lines per leaf, then uh, then you have a serious problem. If this happens toward the end of the season, um, there's uh, you know it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Just plan for yourself to, for the next crop and say I have leaf miner. Uh, I need to spray something early in the season, uh, whether as a drench insecticide or uh, seven or organic options like as a direct end insecticidal soap on a regular spray, uh, on a regular schedule uh, to stop the moth uh, adults from laying eggs and uh, getting a serious problem, G getting a serious uh, reduction in yield if it happens early in the season. Uh, this is uh, common in Texas uh, because of our hot weather and some homeowners don't water regularly and that causes the cucumber and eggplants to develop a bitter taste. Well, uh, stress from drought or excessive hot or cold temperature uh, can cause that problem. I have a solution for bitter uh, uh, eggplants. Um, if this was my eggplant, I will put a lot of uh, salt uh, on the surface here that's cut and uh, let it sit for 10, 20 minutes, doesn't matter, and then wash off the salts. Uh, something about the salts, I don't know how it works, but something about the salts uh, gets, rid of, gets rid of the bitterness. And same thing with the cucumber. But now that's a fix 
temporary fix. Uh, what you should ask yourself is, uh, I, I, I think I, I thought I was watering regularly. Maybe I should water more often. Maybe the same amount of water, but maybe spread twice a day or three times a day instead of once a day, even if it's the same amount. Okay. Next slide. Uh, uh, this is a typical, uh, and, and it happens all the time, uh, and I don't see any serious problem because the earliest flower that uh, fruit that you see here is shriveled, but all the rest uh, seem to be doing fine. Well, what caused that earliest uh, fruit uh, not to uh, continue developing? Well, um, if they were all shriveled or have spores or have some kind of fungus uh, mold growing on them, it's a disease. But when again, when you look at this whole picture, only the earliest one is shriveled and did not develop. Uh, well, it must have flowered uh, early in the, earlier in the season, maybe a week or 10 days ago when it was still cold. And uh, check the weather record for like two weeks ago, and if you find it was cold, then it's possibly uh, bees were not flying and were not pollinating. Of course, uh, if you are uh, serious about gardening, and if you think you have that problem, uh, uh, or, you know, and you want to avoid it, and there's no bees, this flower here is the male flower. You see, it does not have here uh, a tiny uh, uh, squash. Like, like here's a tiny squash, that's a female flower. Here's a tiny squash, that's a female flower. Uh, if you like to do your own pollination, uh, steal the job of the pollinating bees, you can uh, take a mature male flower, remove the petals, and then pollinate uh, the female flowers yourself uh, by hand. It's a fun exercise and then uh, a good hobby for uh, gardeners who like to be in the garden and, do, and keep busy doing something and you can do your own pollination. Okay, uh, gypsum, uh, what does gypsum affect, how does gypsum affect garden soils? Well, I think if you read the bag, the clues are there. Um, uh, and I like that picture where you see all these red uh, here pieces, these are like holes. It's like uh, I spread the gypsum as if I spread all of the hundred holes that are uh, tilling and hoeing the, the garden for me. Uh, well, of course, gypsum uh, raises the pH. That's one role. If you have acidic soil that we have here, that we tend to have here in East Texas, uh, gypsum does help. Uh, but uh, these picture of these holes, uh, basically what they're doing is they're loosening uh, compact soils for you. And of course, they have calcium in it, so they're improving mineral availability. Uh, does it hurt to add a little bit of gypsum every year if your soil pH is low, if you think you need calcium, if you're uh, suffering from uh, blossom and drought, things like that uh, it wouldn't hurt to use it every year. But if you tell me your pH is 7.5, uh, uh, it's not going to uh, help adding anything, you're wasting money. And actually it may hurt. All right, what pest control product best controls worms on cabbage or on every other vegetable? So the key word here I'm asking you is what uh, is the best uh, insecticide if what you all want, want to control is worms? BT. BT is an organic uh, uh, product. Uh, it only kills the worm, and it is safe. Uh, I think the harvest interval is uh, zero or one day, meaning that you can spray today and eat uh, harvest the same day or the day after. Check the label. There's lots of brands of BT. Uh, it's not uh, BT does not work on adults. So if you see a beetle, if you see a ladybug, if you see a squash bug. Any, when they reach the adult stage, you just give them a shower. Uh, you, you're wasting your money spraying BT. I get that comment all the time. Planting marigolds in the garden help control uh, common uh, garden best. Well, which one? And does it really work? Uh, it does work if you plant enough marigolds. 
uh, controlled nematodes. Um, the question is, if you put a one marigold on the edge or even in the middle of the four by eight raised bed, is it gonna sanitize the whole raised bed? Uh, I don't think so. Um, there's really no real evidence. Uh, uh, if you have a large field and you plant marigolds in a circle around the spot that you know you have nematodes, uh, we we believe that that stops the nematode from spreading outside that circle. But one marigold on the edge of the bed, even in the middle of the bed, is just not doing much for you. Uh, so uh, there are other ways to deal with nematodes. You can use solarization, uh, and I have another webinar uh, that I've recorded in the past on solarization, um, uh, go watch it. Okay, now, uh, again, the same picture, is interplanting an, effective, an affected method of controlling insects? So here you have squash on the left and marigolds on the right, uh, and I get, again, I get that question, and I don't know if it's folklore or old wives' tale that, oh, you plant these two, you plant dill next to tomato, and it uh, repels that. I haven't done it. I'm not aware of anybody who's done it scientifically uh, to, uh, to prove it. Um, so the general answer is no. Um, now, insects have a preference for plants. They also have, I don't know if you want to call them taste buds, but they prefer uh, one plant over another. So they will go to that plant first. But if the population of that insect in builds up, they will move out to other plants that really, uh, it's like people, you want to go to your favorite steak restaurant and it's full or the waiting line is an hour, you're willing to go to a uh, I don't know, another type of restaurant, uh, let's say Chinese restaurant, even though that was not your first choice. Same thing with insects. So so uh, it's not magic just because you put uh, marigold next to squash, you're going to repel insect season long, no matter what the insect pressure is. Uh, it, it, uh, so don't count on that as one of the uh, tools that you are using. Now, let me go back to that. Uh, uh, however, there are uh, plants that act as a trap crop. So let's say you, you, have a, you, can, you have a good sized garden and you can afford to plant some sunflower. You plant some sunflower next to your tomatoes. Well, the sunflower uh, attracts uh, sting bugs, leaf-footed sting bugs, more than the, the, the sting bug prefer the oils or the taste of the sunflower more than they prefer the tomato. So your sunflower is a trap crop. You're trapping them there, you're distracting them there. Uh, these things work and commercially more and more growers are starting to plant a row of sunflowers next to their tomato field uh, to, to attract. But again, if the uh, insect population of those leaf footed sting bugs reaches uh, real high numbers, uh, they will move into the tomatoes. Is there any value in interplanting? Absolutely. It's been done for hundreds and hundreds of years in uh, many Asian countries. Imagine somebody with a very limited space and they, and they plant every square inch. Interplanting means planting two different crops next to each other. And you can do it even on a, in a raised bed or, a, you know, in a backyard garden if you keep one uh, principle in mind. You want to plant a long season crop with a short season crop. So, for example, this uh, on the picture on the left, the lettuce here will uh, be done and harvested or spinach, for example, can be done and harvested long before this uh, broccoli uh, leaves out and, and uh, shades over them. So you gained your uh, two crops in the space of uh, in, in the space of one. Uh, interplanting is a great idea. Uh, I encourage you all to learn uh, to try it. Just keep in mind uh, there, there are lists of vegetables that we call uh, short season crops. They are you can harvest them within 30 to 60 days compared to long season crops that uh, are a minimum 75 to 80 days before they start setting, uh, being harvested. Um, 
great toy. Okay, and that's what I'm saying here, planting short season crop with long season crop can extend the season productivity. Okay, plus you are maximizing the space utilization. Remember, your raised bed is a prime real estate. You want to use almost every square inch of it, uh, not look what a commercial grower is using and try to adopt his spacing. You have better soil, you have uh, more controlled irrigation with drip irrigation and fertilization. You can squeeze plants a little tighter uh, and uh, still get good yields. Okay, tomato is a very popular crop, um, uh, you know, in terms of consumption. It's still the number one uh, vegetable every person likes to grow. Uh, and many varieties, if you look at catalogs, you'll see letters, a list of letters next to the name. Uh, v, F, N, T, A, and more and more. Well, each of those letters is an indication of a disease resistance uh, that was built in them during the development of that hybrid. You don't see those letters on heirlooms because they're not hybridized, but you see them on hybrids. Again, this is done by normal breeding technique, not GMO, not nothing. But for example, V, it means uh, resistance to verticillium wilt, F is uh, fissurium wilt, N for nematodes, T is for tobacco mosaic virus, and A is anthracnose. So the easiest way to control a disease or manage a disease is to switch to another resistant variety. You have nematodes one year, and you have to plant uh, tomatoes in that same spot. Um, switch to another variety that has the letter N following uh, the name in the catalog description. Uh, greening of potatoes is caused by exposure to sunlight. If that potato is too shallow, you did not cover it and bury it, it will uh, react to the sun and start making these photosynthetic products uh, to chlorophyll and to photosynthesize. Is it toxic? Uh, well, if you eat a lot of it at one time, and I don't know the exact amount for the average weight of a person, but uh, I don't think you can eat enough uh, at one time to get, to die from it. Okay, uh, so if in doubt, peel it, peel that green uh, tissue out, and fry the rest. You'll be fine. Um, but more importantly. Uh, ask yourself that you failed to add more soil to the bottom of the plant to hill it so that this does not happen again in the future. This is a very common uh, garden insect, and sometimes they have stripes, and sometimes they have uh, dots on the back. And this is the one that can transmit bacterial wilt. The cucumber beetle is the bane of uh, um, uh, gardeners who like to grow uh, cucumbers, squash, uh, they, they love, I mean, of course, it goes on tomatoes and other stuff, but they love these vegetables. Striped or spotted cucumber beetle, you control it early in the season. Not only you control the damage from that, and you, you also control bacterial wilt that is transmitted by this insect. So look up striped or spotted cucumber beetle familiarize yourself with its life uh, cycle, when do people start seeing them, um, and the minute you see the first one, time to spray something. I allude, this is a, a cauliflower, and uh, uh, if you can remember the previous picture I showed you of cauliflower when it was really nice and white, well, this one is discolored, uh, discolored and looks like it's a little uh, brown and, uh, you know, rotten on the surface. Well, uh, and I alluded to that in my previous slide, why we cover uh, the leaves, uh, the, head, the head of the cabbage with leaves. Uh, it's, this discoloration is caused by sunlight. Uh, is it poisonous? No. Does it uh, change the flavor? No. It's just maybe you can shave that part off uh, and, and eat the rest. Of course, this commercially is not uh, sellable. So that, uh, this fruit here, this uh, cauliflower head, is, is a loss to a commercial producer. All right. And I think I alluded to this uh, answer also. 
Um, I told you earlier about uh, why we want to transplant, because we want, we want to win the race against time, uh, because in Texas our tomato season is short because it warms up fast uh, and the humidity is high. So of all these conditions, weather, variety, uh, weather conditions, variety, high fertility, poor pollination, insect, uh, the answer uh, to this is all the above. You can have an insect chewing it, chewing it here, dropping it like a worm. You can have a weather, like I mentioned, too high, uh, too hot and humid at night uh, towards July, end of uh, mid to late July. You may have put a lot of nitrogen fertilizer, which encourages leaves to grow, not uh, flowers, so the plants are bored to flowers all of these things. And some varieties are more susceptible to flower drop than others. So plant early. Uh, you don't like this variety, switch to another variety. Uh, use proper fertilization uh, and you can have a wonderful uh, tomato crop. <clears throat> this is the uh, squash pine border. Uh, after it has uh, crawled from the leaf and drilled the hole, uh, on the crown of the stem. So it, let's say it must have entered here somewhere. And this is a cross section of that stem of the squash. So you see it, it's inside. There's nothing you can spray. It's protected by the tissue itself. It eats it on the inside, cuts the water flow from the roots uh, to the plant, and uh, it wilts. Um, uh, at this stage, there's really nothing you can you can do. But uh, uh, when can you spray? Like I told you, like I think I mentioned that earlier, is when you start seeing the first uh, flower, on the, start checking uh, the bottom side of the leaf. That's where the brown eggs of the uh, squash vine border are found, and you can crush them, you can spray them, and that's the best time to control them. Um, okay, this uh, picture here is the white grub on the left and the adult uh, beetle on the right. Um, the, um, of course, you dig anywhere in your lawn and you'll find them. So if you want to build a garden in uh, soil, in the native soil, not in a raised bed, maybe that's something that you want to do first is spray an insecticide to kill the white crops in the soil. There are lots of uh, turf uh, safe herbicide insecticides that you can use uh, and you add water, the insecticide goes in the soil and kills the white crop and then uh, later you can uh, till and plant and, they, and the insecticide should be safe uh, for the plants or for you. And there are other uh, options available. One of them is milky spore which is a bacteria that you spray and the bacteria kills the, the white crop. Biosafe and biovector are uh, good nematodes. Not all nematodes are uh, your enemy. These are insect killing nematodes. Uh, you spray them. But again, uh, it's, uh, you don't know if that nematode is going to survive and it's going to find a worm or get it. So these three are organic option uh, seven and other synthetic insecticides are also available to spray the soil, uh, drench it, and, and then plant later. Uh, the adult of the white grub is called the June beetle. So if you uh, um, keep that in mind. Okay, these here are leaf hoppers. Uh, they, this picture is very big, but they're very tiny. Uh, they are I mean, very, very small, uh, and you, you get close to them, and they jump real fast and real far. So that's why they call leaf hopper. Uh, I guess you know seven is still the best choice. Uh, I prefer. I tell everybody I prefer uh, liquid seven instead of powder seven. Powder seven, you uh, you when you spread it, it coats the top uh, part of the leaf. Uh, but the insect is smart enough, may crawl on the bottom side of the leaf. Uh, liquid seven, you spray, you cover the top, bottom, you spray top, bottom, every nook and cranny of that uh, plant, and you have better 
cash of control. Okay. Um, you, um, many diseases uh, have this kind of symptoms uh, where uh, the leaf is wilting or half the leaf is yellow uh, or the, all of the leaf is wilting. Um, one uh, habit I have is I always like to peel carefully uh, with a pocket knife the edge of the stem to look at the inside. If you see it brown like this, then uh, you have um, a the fusarium wilt is uh, you know that can has infested the plant and it's eaten it on the inside out. It, it's one of those diseases that you don't see spore, you don't see mold on the outside uh, of the stem, uh, but uh, you can see it on the on the inside when you peel the stem. So maybe a clean pocket knife, have it always handy and. You will see spores at later stages of uh, this disease, but uh, early on, uh, that's the best indication. If the inside of the sorry, if the inside of the stem is brown, that's not normal. You have some disease or another. These uh, insects here are called aphids. Um, they uh, are a serious insect. They're easy to control with any insecticide, but they are still a serious pest because if you if one of them survives, this adult that you see here on the right, left picture uh, does not lay eggs. It gives birth to live pregnant females. So you can imagine from one become two and two become four and four become eight. So in two weeks, you can go from one to 50 or, uh, or 100. Uh, and uh, one clue for me, if I have aphids in my plant, if I see ants crawling up and down the stem, plants have no business uh, being on the plants except to eat the sugar uh, that these aphids uh, ex uh, excrete from the back. Uh, they really, the ants uh, ranch them. They are us, they are they're like people that ranch uh, cattle and they move them from one field to another. If they don't like the sugar uh, or uh, amount of sugar that they are producing, they'll pluck it from this space and then they move it to a new leaf uh, and the aphids love it and they uh, uh, protect them from other ant colonies. I mean, they're, they're like people ranching cattle. So if you see ants crawling up and down, that's a clue you have aphids, uh, spray something before the numbers get really bad. This is a um, tomato that's in, uh, been stung by an insect. Uh, it's, not, it's not poisonous, doesn't have a bad taste, but every little of these yellow spot will have a, um, like a little um, uh, hard tissue. So definitely not commercially sellable uh, and the homeowner may not enjoy the taste, it's not poisonous. Uh, that, is a pro that is the typical symptom of a sting bug that uh, fed on it. Uh, okay, so at that stage, the sting bug can be hard to kill because it's armor uh, and thick skin and uh, they move fast. You try to spray them, they may fly away, so you did not cover them to kill them. The earlier, the better. And I think I've said that a couple of times early. Early season insect control uh, is, is always a great uh, tool for the homeowner. This uh, is a watermelon and really an advanced stage of this downy mildew disease. Uh, you see almost every leaf has one or two or three spots. Uh, the uh, grower here uh, really missed the boat by a long shot and uh, I, at that stage, I don't know what to recommend. Uh, at least familiarize yourself with downy mildew. It's common, usually uh, uh, found in Texas year after year, but, it's, but it can be prevented with regular protective uh, pesticide application. Okay, uh, this is a two type of cracking. Uh, what, we, what we call radial or, or uh, uh, sorry, circular or radial. 
circular here on the top and radio on the side. Uh, this is caused by, and I know some people yell at me when I tell them you're not watering regularly. Um, the, to, imagine the tomato uh, fruit, uh, the skin of the tomato fruit is like a plastic bag and uh, the, plant, the fruit got stressed from lack of water and it becomes hard. And then you, uh, you irrigate and the fruit tries to expand, but the hard skin does not let it expand and it cracks from the, too much pressure from the inside. So uh, mulching uh, always helps uh, moderate the water soil temperature and the water availability to the plant. Uh, but um, more importantly, uh, ask yourself, how often am I on watering? Maybe I should water twice a day if I were to watering once a day, or if I'm watering twice a day, maybe three times a day. Uh, it, uh, you may have to do this. There's no other solution, unfortunately. Potato scab, um, and this is picture here. Is, so yeah, there are lots of other pictures online uh, that shows you better. Um, um, this, uh, visually better the quality than this photo. Uh, so search online for potato scab and uh, uh, it's related to two things. pH, if you have high pH, the fruit uh, will have the scabby tissue. Of course, uh, uh, doesn't mean uh, doesn't mean this is bad. You can throw that away. You can peel it and eat the rest. That's fine. Uh, and uh, uh, irregular watering can also cause the skin to crack and this these little spot to to develop. Okay, this is a corn and uh, corn earworm inside it, feasting, having a good time. Um, uh, in corn, the uh, silking stage when the silk on that ear is green. This is the delicate time to worry about uh, insects for a, for a corn. When they're not developed or when they dry out, uh, really for a homeowner, you're wasting your time, you don't have to worry about spraying anything. But when the silks are still green, uh, this is the uh, 10, 15 days are important uh, to worry about insects. And uh, DT will control it, uh, seven will could kill the adults. Uh, there's lots of options. By the way, corn earworm is exactly the same insect as the uh, tomato fruit worm. They're called differently uh, because they're on different crops, but it's exactly the same. So if you have corn, corn earworm, then expect to have uh, tomato fruit worm. It's the same uh, test and the same control measure. Again, this photo is not the best quality if it's out of focus, but uh, you pull a tomato at the end of the season and you see all these knobs and knots and beads uh, uh, attached, attached on the root of the tomato. Uh, this is typical of uh, root knot nematode. So cleaning your garden, uh, removing the plants as soon as you pull the last fruit is always a good deal um, approach. And it's also the best time to inspect the health of the roots to see, do I have root knot nematode and I have to solarize it or, uh, or not. Um, and uh, okay. What fungicide do you use to control powdery mildew on cucurbits? I've shown you earlier a picture of downy mildew. Powdery mildew is these uh, white leaves here. It looks like you sprayed talcum powder on the leaves. Um, uh, it's uh, common in dry years because powdery mildew doesn't, li doesn't like uh, too much rain uh, and uh, there's uh, it's favored by dry climate, like I said. Bravo is a product for for commercial producers. You may not be able to get it, but for the homeowners, sulfur, neem oil, potassium bicarbonate are all available. Uh, it's uh, really an, what I call easy disease to control uh, if you catch it early. Um, uh, 
I mean, you go to this stage, uh, yes, you may kill it, but the damage is already done. So really for this plant, it's too late. For this watermelon plant, it's too, it's too late. This is looking at a cabbage uh, from the top down. So here's the, here's the core of the cabbage and here's the top edge of the leaf. Here's the top edge of the other leaf. And sometimes you see these deep uh, shape infection that starts on the edge and move down. Here's another V shape infection that starts on the edge. Here's another one V shape. Uh, this is typical infection. And uh, uh, we call that black rot. Uh, look up black rot. Learn everything you need to know about black rot, uh, what better fungicides you need to spray, what products you need to spray if you are uh, uh, love to grow cabbages, uh, you know, other cold crops year after year. The, these are not the ornamental uh, winter squash. These are regular yellow squash varieties, and they have all these spots. Well, this is a virus infection. It's what we call topical infection. It does not go all the way. It does not kill. It doesn't rot the fruit. And, uh, it's, uh, it just looks funny. You can still eat it. It's not uh, uh, changed the taste, in my opinion. Of course, commercially, you cannot sell it. Uh, but again, uh, these are viruses are transmitted or vectored by insects. So again, early season insect control, not only controls the damage from the insect, but also controls the damage from the disease that they may uh, transmit. What causes onion to bulb? Bulbing in onion is influenced by day length. If you live uh, south of I-20, then ask for varieties uh, that are short day varieties. Okay, if you live uh, north of I-20 in Texas, then you want to get intermediate uh, uh, onion varieties. And if you're up north, then you want uh, long day uh, onions, like Kentucky, Michigan, uh, all these varieties. So uh, you choose the wrong variety, they'll just grow and they will never uh, bulb up. Another problem with onions is that they will go directly to a flower. Onion is a two-year plant. The first year makes the bulb, but if you leave it in the ground, next year it will make flower. Well, sometimes you put a slip, and that first year it will immediately uh, develop a flower. Well, uh, what happened to that young seedling is that it got exposed to low temperature, uh, and that induced uh, bolting or flowering. So uh, in a situation like this where the whole field, that's a whole loss, that's a total loss to the to the, to the commercial growers, sometimes it's individual plants here or there. Uh, the flower stalk, uh, before it opens, uh, like this on the upper left picture, the flower stalk is not a waste. You can cut it, uh, harvest it, cut it. It tastes like green onion. Uh, really, it's a delicacy in many countries uh, of the world. This is a sweet potato, and this is the injury, and this is a, and this picture, sweet potato weevil. This picture is a better close-up of the sweet potato weevil. That may be one of the, re one of the reasons why uh, we lost a lot of acreage in Texas uh, from damage from sweet potato weevil, because a lot of the insecticide we used to use are not available anymore. So if you have a sweet, you harvest your sweet potato and it's rotten and has holes like tunneling on the inside everywhere and you, if you wait long enough you may see one crawling out you have sweet potato weevil. Uh, during uh, wet weather this is the most common in my opinion a disease in tomatoes uh, for homeowners early blight it's very easy to control I, I think you your tomatoes uh, when they start maturing you don't want any leaves uh, touching the soil. Um, uh, to reduce infection uh, from the soil or uh, uh, as a potential source of infection. Okay, briefly, uh, the top, uh, the picture on the top left is a cucumber uh, beetle. This is the spotted cucumber beetle. In an earlier slide, I showed you the striped cucumber beetle. That's a foe. That's not a friend of your garden. But uh, compared to the uh, 
lady beetle here on the bottom right. Uh, I think one way I like to determine if it's a lady beetle is that, uh, uh, I don't know if you want to call it W or what are those two spots with the black ring around them. Uh, that's, an, that's an indication it's a lady beetle. Okay. Now, again, this picture is not very uh, clear, uh, but you see this bronzing. Uh, you see some little, these white, uh, these spots here. You look closer, you try to touch them with your fingertips, they start to crawl away. Uh, this is spider mites. Spider mites uh, love dry, hot weather. Uh, so you may not see them this time, uh, early this time in the season, but in July, uh, when it warms up, especially on a dry year, you will have spider mite. Spider mite is not an insect, it's a spider. So don't get an insecticide to control spider mites. Get a miticide. Make sure whatever product you um, you uh, buying either says mites or either says uh, miticide. Uh, for example, seven is an insecticide. It's not gonna kill uh, the spider mites. Uh, this insect here, are, uh, are these five are all the same uh, insect, just different stages of growth. So uh, that's uh, always good to learn uh, to identify the insect, even at the young stage, at the egg stage, and even at the various stages so you can catch it early. Everybody knows squash bug when it's an adult, but they may not know when it's at this stage and wonder, is that a good guy or is that a bad guy? Uh, so education is the best. Uh, this common uh, garden insect is the Colorado potato beetle. It loves uh, potatoes, uh, tomatoes, eggplants, uh, all, all that family. Uh, if uh, you like to sacrifice a one plant to host it, I recommend you use a white type of eggplant. They, they enjoy that taste more than the, the purple or black eggplant, and uh, you can use it as a trap crop. And they, you find them more there before they start infecting the rest of the garden. And uh, the following few slides before we end are none. Pathogenic tomato diseases. This is blossom end rot. Uh, yes, there's mold growing on them, but that's a secondary infection. That's not what caused uh, the rotting on the bottom side of the fruit. Uh, the problem here is a uh, combination of calcium deficiency and uh, uh, exaggerated by lack of uh, regular watering. You may have all the calcium in the world in the soil, but if you're not watering enough, uh, the plant will not get enough calcium. Okay, we talked about uh, cracking in uh, tomatoes, and again, you're not uh, uh, watering regularly, and is aggravated by excessive moisture, um, you know, alternating between excessive lack of moisture and excessive moisture. Okay, this is what we call cat facing. Sometimes it's common in heirloom varieties, and people think that, oh, that's the beauty of the heirloom variety, it should look like this. Cat facing is not a disease, it does not affect the taste, it just looks ugly. Um, it's a poor pollination or inadequate pollination, and just grows in different uh, uh, speeds and different pace. Uh, and the area that does not grow because of poor pollination just dies and cracks and the tissue grows around it. Uh, if you let it ripen, and you, uh, it will be just fine. Definitely not uh, uh, commercially sellable. And uh, this is what we call puffiness. Uh, puffiness uh, on the outside, you see the tomato instead of being perfectly round, it's angular. And when you cut it on the inside, when you cut it, uh, cut through it, uh, you see the gel is so small or maybe dry or there's a big gap, air gap. The gel does not really fill the whole space here. This is caused by inadequate pollination, fertilization, or seed development. Uh, does it affect the taste? No. Uh, again, it's one of those things that commercially we cannot sell anymore. With that, I uh, finish the presentation. 